don't miss it. Professor Osase Faraday Oromese, fellow Nigerian Society of Engineers, other principal officers of the university, provosts, deans and directors, emerita professors, visiting vice chancellors from sisters institutions, your royal highnesses, top government functionaries, staff and students, invited guests, gentlemen of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome every one of you to today's inaugural lecture. This is the 194th in the inaugural lecture series of the University of Benin to be delivered by Professor Ikbomosa Abraham of Bogodo. Topic, the reading world its impact on us all in the quest for our daily bread. May I humbly invite the Registrar, O.A. Ocean and Mrs., to introduce the Vice-Chancellor and members of the Vice-Chancellor's procession, the Registrar. Distinguished invitees, you are all welcome to the 194th inaugural lecture series of the University of Benin. Please permit me to stand on the existing protocol already observed by the University PRO. It is my rare privilege and honor to introduce the Vice Chancellor's entourage, which is led by the Vice Chancellor himself, Professor FFO Orumesi. in the Vice Chancellor's entourage are the Deputy Vice Chancellor, P, Professor P. E. Irowokwe, we, we also have the Deputy Vice Chancellor at Kenwa Campus, Professor G. E. Eriya Rebu. We have representing the Bossa, Mr. Echi. <laughs> On the other side of the days, we have Professor V. I. Yawo, Provost College of Medical Sciences. <laughs> we also have the Dean School of Postgraduate Studies. Professor Victor E. Omozua. We have the Dean of Students, Professor O. V. Osadolo. We have the host Dean, Faculty of Agriculture, Professor M. A. Bamikoli. Momo. We 
have representing the Dean Faculty of Physical Sciences, Professor E. Ariel Melo. We have Dean Faculty of Pharmacy, Professor O. J. Akerele. We have Dean Faculty of Social Sciences, Professor D. B. E. Oriaki. We also have directors. We have Director General Studies, Professor J. A. Akoku. We have Director CROPUICT, Professor F. O. Ehaise. We have Director Center for Gender Studies, Professor Mrs. E. U. Edosoma. We have Acting Director, Institute of Child Health, Dr. D. Nwaneri. We have Director, Center for Part-Time Programs, Professor Mrs. K. A. Hirafuna. We have Director, IPAES, Professor S. O. Ibeyi. We have Acting Director, Institute of Education, Dr. D. Omorope. The last but not the least, we have Dr. P. O. Ukwedi, Acting Director, Center for Maritime and ICT. We also have the Liberian, University Liberian, Dr. Mrs. Omolu Abidiolu. It is now my pleasure to call on the Vice Chancellor to introduce the lecturer of the day. to stand on the existing protocol. Okay. It is with great pleasure I welcome you all to the 194th lecture of the University of Benin and the 47th in my tenure at Venture Center. <laughs> Today's lecture is the eighth lecture to be delivered in the Faculty of Agric. Department of Soil Science and Environment. As a way of providing routine updates and activities in the university, I'm glad to inform you that, that the 2016-17 second semester examinations are in progress in the schools, faculties, and institutes. I thank all for your support so far, and I want to use this opportunity to solicit for the cooperation of all stakeholders to ensure the each free conduct of the examinations. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce our lecturer for today. He is Professor Ipmamosa Abraham Bawada. This impact on us all in the quest for our daily bread. <laughs> Professor Bomosa of Bogodo was born on the eighth day, sorry, on April 30th, 1954, in Akure, to the family of late Mr. Alfred Osaiku Woman of Bogodo and Mrs. Omore Nuwa. Of Bogodo, Ne Ebon, of Oredo, Government Area of Edo State. 
He attended St. Peter's Edgham Primary School in the city from 1960 to, to 1965 and obtained the first school list living certificate in 1965. He had his Secondary school education at Ebusai Grammar School, New City, from 1966 to 1970, and obtained the West African School Certificate in 1970. He was admitted into the University of Nigeria, Osuka, in 1973, and graduated in 1978 with a bachelor's degree in soil science. After completing his NYC in 1979, he worked briefly in the Ministry of Agriculture, University, and proceeded to the University of Ibadan, where he obtained a master's degree in agronomy in 1980. He taught in Edo College, University, and the College of Education, the Yaro University, before, gaining, sorry, before joining the then Bender State University, Ekboma, as an assistant lecturer in 1982, where he began his university career. He returned to the University of Ibadan in 1987 to, be, to begin his PhD program. In, 19, in 1990, he went to the Institute of Ecology and Resource Management, University of Edinburgh, Scotland, to carry out part of his PhD research. He returned to the University of Ibadan in 1992 and obtained his PhD degree in agronomy specializing in soil microbiology from the university in 1994. He joined the services of the University of Benin in 2001 as a senior lecturer and rose to the ranks, becoming a professor in 2007. Professor Provador was the Dean Faculty of a Greek University of Benin 2011 to 2016. He has had so he has held several positions within the university, among which are one, acting head Department of Soil Science, University of Benin, member University Senate, Polytechnic Coordinator, Department of Soil Science, University of Benin, Faculty Rep. University, UAB, University of Benin, Chairman, Farm Management Committee, Member, Business Committee of Senate. Outside the University of Benin, he has served in several capacities, such as Acting Head, Department of Agronomy, AAU Ekoma, Chairman, University Tentable Committee, AAU Ekoma, Part Time Member, Board of Trustees. So, Board of Directors, Edo Pharmaceuticals, Benin City, Member, University Senate, AAU Ekoma, Vice Chairman, Association of Deans of Agriculture in Nigerian Universities. <laughs> professor Bordo has been visiting, has been visiting professor to at the Niger Delta University at Bayesa. He has served as a, in, as a member of NUC accreditation to several universities and has served as a senior as as assessor and examiner of professional or professional or professional candidates in academic in an academic and professional institution within and as the country. He has contributed to the advancement of knowledge with over 50 publications in reputable national <laughs> He has supervised seven PhD students, one major and six postdocs. Thirteen MSc students, eight major and five co-supervised, as well as several undergraduate students. It's a review of articles for publications in the following journals: Nigeria Journal of Soil Science, Nigeria Journal of Life Science, Journal of, Ag of Agriculture. Forestry and fisheries. Professor Bobado is a member of several associations and prof uh, professional bodies, such as the Agronomy Society of America, 
Soil Science Society of America, International Soil Science Society, Nitrogen Fixing Tree Association, Agricultural Society of Nigeria, and Soil Science Society of Nigeria. He has also been a recipient of several awards, among which are Benin Divisional Council Scholarship, 1986-1970, Federal Government Bursary 75-78, Vice of Ibadan Pulgari Scholarship, 1981-1980-1981, Federal Government Pulgari Scholarship, 1981-1982, and 1983 and 1984. EEC Pulgarde Training Award, 1989-1991. Professor Kovodo is a Christian and uh, has served in various leadership positions in the, in the body of Christ. He is married to Mrs. Bamitele Charity Obodo Ne Eboreme, and they are blessed with five children. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, join me in inviting Professor Kiko <laughs>
Deputy Vice Chancellors, who are here present, the Registrar and other principal officers of the University of Benin, members of Council, Provost College of Medical Sciences, Dean School of Graduate Studies, Dean Faculty of Agriculture, Deans of other faculties who are here present, directors of institutes and other units, heads of departments, faculty of agriculture, and of course, my own head of the department, Department of Social Science, chairman of the academic staff union of universities, students of the faculty of agriculture, other faculties, may actually be described as a junior members in statute of the library, respected members of the clergy, family members, all guests, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Vice Chancellor, this lecture I'm giving is dedicated to the Almighty God, who has made it possible for this lecture to hold. And when I applied in 2015 to ask for a date for an inaugural lecture, but I was told that the earliest possible date really was 2017. At that time, it looked so far. I want to thank God that today it has become a reality. the lives of members of my family and the lives of every one of us here. Therefore, sir, it is with joy and a deep sense of humility that I accept your invitation to deliver this inaugural lecture, which is the eighth from my faculty and the first from my department, the Department of Science. my vice chancellor since this is the first from my department i consider it necessary to acquaint this honorable audience with some basic facts about the soil what soil is the functions of the soil what the discipline soil science is all about and perhaps how i came into soil science and then specifically the specialty of soil microbiology. Well, let's begin with that basic issue of what is soil. I'm sure if I were to ask all of us here, we have our definitions for soil. Those definitions may fit into one or more of what I want to read now. Well, to the farmer, the soil is simply the factory from where he collects his products. In other words, he puts something in the after a period of he goes back there and then he collects what he wants. The geographer views the soil 
as it relates to the study of the area distribution of soil. To the civil engineer, the soil is that structure with which and upon which structures may be built. The soil is that material with which and upon which he may erect his structures. Well, as far as the mining engineer is concerned, the soil is that dirty substance covering the pressure stone is looking for, which must be removed as part of purifying the precious jewel he wants. Well, to the simple housewife, the soil is that place behind her house where all the rubbish from the kitchen can be dumped in Bini, that is called Oji. And then somehow, and the housewife may be right because he goes there, he finds that the things he has done, they have turned into one crop or the other, especially tomatoes. <laughs> However, in the closure of soil science steps, the soil is technically defined as the collection of natural bodies occupying parts of the earth's surface that is capable of supporting plant growth and that has properties resulting from the integrated effects of climate and living organisms acting upon parent material as conditioned by topography over periods of time. Well, for us in soil science, that is the complete definition of soil. And if you look at it critically, that definition incorporates the view of the housewife, the civil engineer, the mining engineer. If I take of every person, it only adds the factors of soil formation, which are actually five. You have your climate, you have the living organisms, you have the parent materials, you have topography, and you have uh, time. Generally, those are the five factors of soil formation. So there has been an attempt to include man as a factor of soil formation. But some of us argue that man is part of living organisms. Well, the soil as we know it has very, very distinct properties. And these properties usually are revealed in the soil profile. The soil profile is a vertical section that is dug through the soil from the surface to a distance of about six feet. That figure one is just a schematic representation of the soil profile. And there we find that the profile has several rises. Majorly, we have the O, which is the rising of the surface, or just, and then we have the A, and then we have the B, we have the C, and then the bedrock, which is the arrow, Horizon, not actually T, it's actually referred to as the arrow horizon. Then figure two is also a representation of a soil profile, which thank you, was actually dug in situ close by here at a village called Osasinoba, where we have a pathologist in the department who does that often in the person of uh, Dr. Omen. And then, we also have another profile pit, which was dug in far away Kebi, at Jaga in Kebi State. So the properties of a soil usually are viewed from the soil profile. And the soil has biological, chemical, mineralogical, and physical properties. When the soil microbiologist that is the area to which I belong, is actually interested in the biological properties of the soil. And these properties are woven around the activity of microorganisms, which are considered the architects of soil health and quality. Well, we'll talk about that much later as we progress. So, sir, I'm giving that background to what the soil is and how the properties are defined in the profile. What are some of the functions of the soil? Well, that figure one displays the six major categories in which soil functions. 
Well, the first is that the soil actually serves as a medium for plant growth, which is the view of the farmer and the view of the endophologists. Within the soil, there are nutrients where the plant roots take all and then they use for their growth. Secondly, the soil also, they are the physical factors controlling water, the effect of water in the hydrology hydrologic system. In other words, water contamination, water loss, water utilization, the factors that control them are actually within the soil. And then the soil also functions as nature's recycling system. Most of the elements we find in nature, you know, name them nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. You see, their cycles pass through the soil. Then in addition, the soil is also the engineering medium, which is shown there. In other words, it is the material in human built up ecosystems, warehouses, where airports, and other materials are erected. The soil also contributes to the gases in the atmosphere. If I lot of gases are emitted from the soil, uh, oxygen, methane, and they affect the gas balance in the upper layers of the atmosphere. So when we are talking about uh, climate change, global warming, because the gases and the heat re-radiated from the soil contribute a lot. When the soil science as an academic discipline, well, what is soil science about? It is that branch of science that concerns itself with the formation, the nature, the ecology, and the classification of soil. The aim really is to identify, interpret, and manage soils first for agriculture and then for other purposes. Soil science is a very wide subject area and has many sub-disciplines and areas of specialization, among which is soil microbiology, which is my own area. We also have soil chemistry, soil physics, soil fertility, pedology, you know, to mention a few. Therefore, to be a student of soil science, you must have a thorough knowledge of the basic sciences. And I dare say you must also be an intelligent person. <laughs> well, I did that, how did I find myself in soil science and in soil microbiology? Well, looking back now, I feel it as something that was, well, divinely arranged. When I tell the story, you may understand what I'm saying so. Really, when I applied to the University of Nigeria, Amsuka, in 1973, when I wrote the constitutional entrance exam, I applied to the Department of Animal Science. That was my first choice. But when the admissions, when the first set of admissions were made, I was offered the admission to the Department of Plant Soil Science. So I accepted the admission, did my registration, completed everything, and set to in that department. Then some weeks later, the university published supplementary admissions. And my name then appeared in the department I earlier chose, which was the Department of Animal Science. But because I completed everything about my registration in plant soil, I opted to remain there. And when the department was split into two, to crop and soil science, I opted for soil science. And then in my final year, we had a lecturer in the department, and that happens often with students, whom I saw as a complete gentleman, very hard working. Really. Because a man would spend his time in the lab. And I also remember one of those occasions, I invited him for a program in a Christian you know, and he came. So in my final year, we were being asked to choose areas of project. If I went to the top, when he brought out the topics, I chose his area. Again, most students at times run away from his area. The reason is that he will make you work, but he will also do the work with you. And so I chose his area. So that was how the late Dr. N. N. I became a student. And then that same year, I saw that examiner came from the University of Ibadan, the late professor Odo. He was also a soil microbiologist. So after my youth service, I went to Ibadan to do my postgraduate work on that. So that is why I said, 
It was actually purely by divine providence. Verse 12 says also, after giving all that preamble, we want to get to the scope of today's lecture. As already stated, the topic is a hidden word. It's impact on us all in the quest for our daily bread. I shall attempt in this lecture to provide an understanding of what the hidden word is and the biodiversity, the organisms that we find there. Their abundance, their distribution, and the factors that affect them will also be looked into. Then the audience will also be informed of some, of some of the activities of these organisms. And also at the end, so try to provide the evidence from our research concerning the activities of the organisms. Well, as much as possible, the language will be simple. We'll try to avoid some technical jargons is to make for easy understanding and it is so that at the end we would have had a thorough understanding of soil science and perhaps the parents here will encourage their children to read soil science. <laughs> when the hidden world, the concept of the hidden world is best captured in a statement by Peter Farrell in 1959. According to him, we live on the rooftops of a hidden world. Beneath the soil lies a world of fascination and also of mysteries. For much of man's wonder about life itself has been connected with the soil. It is populated by strange creatures who have found ways to survive in a world without sunlight, an empire whose boundaries are fixed by the walls. In other words, in the opinion of Peter Farr, as I'm standing here, I'm standing on the wall beneath my feet. Where you are sitting, you are sitting down on a wall beneath your feet. And that wall is made up of organisms. In fact, in another way, somebody also said, if our bodies were small enough to enter the tiny passages in the soil, we will discover a world populated by a wide array of creatures, all fiercely competing for every leaf, every root, every faker pellet, and dead body that reaches the soil. Where the import of both assertions is the fact that the soil houses an array of organisms, so varied and so diverse, with many species yet to be identified. These organisms play vital roles in the soil. They are in fact the architects in the soil that ensure soil health and quality. So the hidden world actually is the world of those organisms that we find inside the soil. They are so diverse, they are found in both the plant and animal kingdoms. And the species vary from the ones we see with the ordinary eyes to the ones that are invisible except under the microscope. Well, in an attempt to explain the second part of our topic, the quest for our daily bread, of course we all know that as human beings, the whole essence of doing whatever we are doing is to have something to it, to have something on our table. I'm coming to work here so that I will have daily bread. The man who is laboring in the market or somewhere is the same purpose. And in fact, the Lord himself, Matthew 6, 11, taught us to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. So it is understandable, therefore, that all our efforts at technological development, educational development, agricultural development, and medical development are actually geared towards meeting the basic needs of life. And these organisms in the hidden world beneath our feet are faithful partners in achieving these goals. The reason being that if they play important roles in the food chain or the food web, and for us in soil science, they are actually the beginning of the food web because of the role they play in the biogeochemical circles of nature. So what we are saying is that 
the secret is actually in the soil. The soil itself is the recipient or the sink for all waste from human activities. Those activities could be in the industry, could be agricultural, could be domestic. So the soil becomes the sink or the ultimate recipient of all the waste. And while meeting these are uh, deliberate needs, if these waste are led to accumulate in our environment, life or net will be unbearable. Therefore, this organisms in the hidden world degrade and detoxify these materials, thus keeping soil health and quality in equilibrium and maintaining environmental quality. Where that table shows the diversity of organisms we may find in the soil, beginning with bacteria, which is microscopic, they are fungi. In fact, in the soil, it is believed that in one gram of soil, you may have as much as one billion uh, bacteria. And they are fungi, protozoa, nematodes, arthropods, earthworms, and other you know, animal forms we find in the soil. Well, these are the schematic representations. That, the first figure there, is an attempt to show us that within this soil, we find several organisms. And then if you go B, actually we are seeing an earthworm moving within the soil. And all these animals, all these organisms, as we will see, play very vital roles, keeping the soil in place, and also ensuring that we have food on our tables. Again, that is an artist, an artist impression of the organisms we find in the soil. On top of that soil, we find a, a tree that is falling, and then we find the leaves. We find a clay rat, we find mushroom, and then inside the soil we find centipedes, we find some ants, some insects, you know, moving around. So that is what the organisms in the soil, in the hidden world, represent. When we think the soil, there's an area referred to as the rhizosphere. There we are seeing a human being with his hands digging up the roots of the soil, the roots of the plant with some soil in it. The rhizosphere is actually the region within the soil where you have a larger concentration of soil organisms. As we move further away from the rhizosphere, the number of organisms reduces. Why are they present in that place? That is because the roots secrete some substances which are food materials for those uh, organisms. So the microbial population of the rhizosphere differs both quantitatively and qualitatively from that outside these small zones and may vary with plant species, root soil, and soil type. But there are several factors that affect the distribution, the activity, and the population of organisms in our soil. So of these factors, we are not going to go into the details discussing them, but if we get the publication, we'll find some explanations on each. But I'll just take perhaps two, and then show us how they affect soil organisms. Take for example number two there, which is the cultural practices. By cultural practices, we mean those practices that farmers involve that you know, help to grow crops in the soil. Things like cultivation. When the soil is cultivated, the organisms are exposed to higher temperatures. Some may survive, some may die. If you also apply fertilizer or you apply herbicides, those are all part of cultural practices. They are fed in numbers and the activities of these organisms. If you also look at soil moisture, usually in the soil there's what we call the water holding capacity, which is, you know, anything above that when the soil pores are blocked, it means the organisms cannot survive. When we only the fact, again, these are relative numbers and biomass of both animal and plant lives that we find in the soil, the microflora and then the animals. Where these organisms play some in the soil, 
the algae with the growth of plants. The nutrients that find the lines exist in the soil. It is from the soil they take them. They are also active in soil structure. In other words, soil aggregation. How do they do that? The mycelium or the strands of fungi help to bind soil particles together. The same way the casts from earth form also help to bind those particles together. But well, they are also important in organic matter breakdown, in human formation, in cycling of nutrients, and then in fixation of nitrogen. We'll talk about the look at the evidence from research. They also act as biocontrol agents and biofertilizers. They have to degrade pesticides in soil, and then they are also responsible for the biodegradation of hydrocarbons. My Vice Chancellor sir, and then this noble audience, I won't say all that. What evidence do we have from research that these organisms actually play, play these roles that we are talking about? Well, my research experience in soil microbiology has been in four major areas. One, nitrogen fixation. Two, nitrification. Three, we have also looked at the possible use of waste as soil amendments. And then, we've also been looking recently at the aspect of bioremediation. How can we reclaim soils that are polluted using some of these organisms? We'll begin with biological nitrogen fixation. Where I want to explain what nitrogen fixation is all about. Usually, nitrogen is quite abundant in the atmosphere. It's more than 70% that's the nitrogen. But that cannot be used by plants in that elemental form. It has to be reduced, it has to be converted to the nitrate form, which is NO3. It is in that form that whatever you are growing can take up nitrogen. So as abundant as it is in the atmosphere, it is not usable by plants unless it is converted to nitrate. And there are three possible ways of doing that. One is industrial. Then secondly, there are two other ways which are in nature. Industrial fixation, which I'm sure the chemists here know about, is the cloud wash process or cloud harbor process, which involves reacting nitrogen and hydrogen under very high temperature and pressures. And then you get your ammonia. Ammonia actually is the basis of all nitrogenous fertilizers. It is from ammonia you can produce nitrate, nitrogen-based fertilizers. But in nature, there are two ways nitrogen can be fixed. First is by lightning. During lightning, actually, the high energy carried by lightning breaks the nitrogen bond, you know, the nitrogen molecule separates into atoms. Then that nitrogen reacts with oxygen to get nitric, nitrogen dioxide. It is that one that is added with rain as nitrate to the soil. So plants, by that means, can also get nitrate. The only problem is that the one coming from that is in trace quantities. The other aspect in nature that has to fit is this biological nitrogen fixation, which is fixation by some organisms in association with the roots of some plants. It can be in association with rhizobium, I mean rhizobium and legume plants. It can be some antinomycins with some non-leguminous plants. But it is an environmentally friendly and benign source of plant usable fixed nitrogen. It does not leave any hazard in the soil. It does not create any problem. It has no side effects. And usually the nitrogen is fixed in the nodules of the plants. And what those swellings we are seeing, the roots are not sick. These are, this is not disease. This is uh, nodules that are produced on the roots of plants. It is those nodules that form the site, the, the site for nitrogen fixation. 
And for some of us who live only to God, perhaps behind our houses, perhaps we are great cowboy or we are great granddaughter. And you go there to try and invest, you dig up the roots, you find some swellings on the roots. Those roots, those swellings are actually no juice. And most times that they are pink in color. When they are pink in color, it shows that they are active. It means that they are fixing that. If it is white in color, the salt nodules are not fixing nitrogen. Well, there are various systems in the soil that fix nitrogen. You have the symbiotic, you have the non-symbiotic. But at the end, they add several kilograms of nitrogen to the soil. So from our research, we used some uh, tree legumes. You know, in fact, the whole idea about nitrogen fixation began with the screening of some tree legumes at the University of Ibado for the possible fixation of nitrogen. So those legumes we screened include Abyssia lebeck. Uh, in Bini, that is the plant we call a seri seri. In Bini. Then we also try to screen Pentacletra macrophylla. That is the oil bee tree. In Bini, we call that one Opara. Then Lucina lusocephala, common name Lucina. Then we have dialogue in this. These are all three legumes. The common name for dialogue is Velvet Tamari, which again, in our local diet, dialect here in Bini, is Omugen. Then we have Acacia Nanotica. And then lastly, Acacia Nodosa. So we started out trying to screen those legumes to find out if they can nodulate. And if they do nodulate, they also fix nitrogen. Well, a major contribution to knowledge that arose from that initial screening was the fact that we found that uh, that plant, Pentatletra macrophylla, had, had the ability to nodulate. In fact, our report of World War II, 1992, was actually the first ever report in literature that that plant can nodulate. That report was in 1992. Well, what we are seeing there, that is the, the pentacletal seeds, the bucket, that is it, as going on the plant, and then those are the pots from which they were actually collected. Like I said, in our environment, that is your para plant or the oil bean uh, tree. Well, those tables show the results from that first report of no duration, the protection trauma And then the, then we went ahead to use some other methods to assess whether some of these legumes can fix nitrogen. And we use the N50 methodology, you know, assessing the abilities of Abyssia lebeck and Sinalusocephala to fix nitrogen. If that experiment showed that of the two of them, the findings were that this Lebeck had a higher nutrilating ability than Lucina and also fixed more nitrogen, as we can see there. Whereas Abyssia fixed as much as 285 kg nitrogen per hectare, which is a lot compared to 73.5 by Lucina. Where that table is still from that report. And then using these five legumes, I've grown over a period of five months, we also attempted to find out whether it is possible for these other ones to also nodulate. And at the end, consistently, it was those two that produce nodules and also fixed nitrogen. Well, in our own experiment, Acacia nanotica. They didn't produce any nitrogen, they also fix any nitrogen. But there are reports in literature that nanotica can actually modulate and also fix nitrogen. But our result didn't show that it can. So of them, of the five of them, it's the same Abyssia and the Lucina that had nitrogen fixed and no juice produced. Table seven and eight actually 
show the details of those results. And then beyond just the assessment, depending on the native rhizopia in the soil, we also wanted to find out if some environmental factors can affect the node relating ability. Factors like if you add nitrogen fertilizer, you try to those ones that, don't, that do not modulate normally, will it result in modulation? Will it result in fixation? And so we did a lot of studies, you know, involving the addition of uh, urea to see if that will enhance modulation. And uh, the report, well, like many of them, but although that they didn't modulate, they didn't have to modulate because of nitrogen addition, they still did not modulate. And those that modulated, we found that at higher levels of nitrogen application, in fact, fixation was uh, hindered, suggesting that the organism do not need any enhancement from any fertilizer to do their work. And then also, we looked at the effect of light intensity as a factor on these organisms. When this very experiment that was published in August 2001 was actually carried out in Edinburgh at the Institute of Ecology and Resource Management, University of Edinburgh. Well, we all know that in that environment, we got the weather, you can hardly grow things outside. So this one was carried out in some growth chambers in the Institute. And then in the growth chamber, you could simulate high light and low light. In other words, high temperature, low temperature, shade conditions. And at the end, the findings suggested that we had better nucleation and better fixation of nitrogen under high low light. Somebody might then ask, why this interest in tree legumes? What is so special? Because commonly, people are generally green legumes, things like cowpea, things like granules. If I remember as a student, when the tractor driver in our department was laying out the field for my experiment, we went to the field together one day. He talked to me, he said, he said, ah, oh, okay. Now only you guys say they plant things where they know they eat. <laughs> He said, you are the late professor at Kenova. He said, it's only two of you in this department that plant things that people know it. Well, the whole idea about these uh, three legumes arose in the late 80s and early 90s. When in IIT, a system of farming was actually being developed, a technology that can help farmers. And that system is early cropping. You know, the early cropping system of it. It's a kind of farming whereby you have rows of trees, and then between the rows of trees, you have alleys. And then the crops you want to cultivate are grown in those alleys. The philosophy was that these trees, as well as using nitrogen fixing trees, we have to fix nitrogen, which these plants can utilize, and therefore there may be no need for fertilizer application. The farmer will save, you know, some income. So that was actually the whole idea. And that period, if you were a student in UI, or a student, you know, in IIT, a research fellow, the interest and the emphasis was actually on early cropping. And uh, a lot was achieved with early cropping. It was not just at that level. IIT also liaised with the state ADPs, so that they can transfer the technology to them and then through them reach the farmers. And I remember somewhere in Europe, I was at Ekoma then, where there was a farm, and I had a student who went, I would have some publications really, where some of these children like were used to grow, and we were used in this early cropping system, and their maize was grown in between them. You know, plants like green residual was used, Kajanus Kajan was also used. And at the end of the day, those plants that were grown in those alleys did better. Well, we'll find those ones in October 2008 and 2000 B. Well, unfortunately for us, as is common with our system, 
when I take a lot of forms, I've got that research uh, issue also appeared, you know, to just uh, die down. But in another part of the world, the Himalaya specifically, which is a very mountainous region, that technology worked and is still working. Look at that, that is a recent photograph, it's 2017. That's a farm in the Himalayas in the mountain, really. So they tried out this early system of cropping. Most of people think that it's impossible to grow across, you know, in hilly areas. But what they do is they plant the hedge trees and in between grow their crops. Of course, the trees will stop erosion as water is moving, but the trees act as bricks. And so day up to tomorrow, that system of farming is still very much involved. So that was, although these plants we are talking about are not eating, uh, where they find usefulness in terms of uh, cross being grown in between them. Well, as I said earlier, a second aspect of our research was actually nitrification. Where nitrogen fixation and nitrification are parts of natural transformations in the soil. Nitrification is a two-step process that involves conversion of ammonium to nitrate. The first step Ammonium is converted to nitrite, and then it's converted to the nitrate is then converted to nitrate. The organisms involved in that, the first step is nitrosomonas, which is a well, a bacterial genus in the soil. And then the conversion from nitrate to nitrate is mediated by nitrobacter, which is another genus of bacteria we find in the soil. In fact, this process has a very high agronomic significance. Like I said earlier, the only form in which plants can use nitrogen is by nitrate. Anything outside that, you know, the plants, you know, well, 99% of the times you will not be able to use the nitrate. So we did some work on nitrification. In fact, my master's thesis on that professor who there was actually on nitrification. But I did a work that involved a, a co-researcher in NIFO, the present acting executive director of the high school in there, using some of their sites, some of their well, NIFO, which is the base station, the Koga to Subi, which are substations. We got soils from those stations and then look at the risk of nitrification in those soils. And at the end we found that uh, in the base station, which is NIFO, you actually had higher rates of nitrification than in the soil stations. We put this is the point one is trying to study that look, these organisms, we see these trees growing, we see opara, we see oil palm, and at times we just need them. There are organisms within that are ensuring that they have food to eat. We are talking about the utilization of waste, which is another focus of research in the department. And that also attracted my interest. When waste comes from diverse means, we have industrial waste, we have agricultural waste, we have waste from so many sources. And we have used some of them, agricultural waste, which includes things like your cassava peels. We people eat and throw away plantain peels. You know, uh, even cocoa, uh, cocoa pots, rice pots, these are things we talk. But we also reason that look, it is possible. If I learn that from the man I said at home, so can let him to help me. And we, he worked with a lot of waste. I learned that from him. So we reason that look, it is possible that some of these materials can be used as soil amendments. Ever before the issue of organic farming came up, so these trials had started. And so we have assessed the potentials of cassava peels and last hogs for seeing the effect of the application on the dry matter yield of some plants, as well maize as test crop. When we did that, comparing cassava peels and rice hogs, we found that the rice hogs had better yields than the cassava peels. Again, for obvious reasons, if you look at that publication, the rice source analysis, we see the nutrients there, 
and I will see the ones in cassava. Cassava peas enhanced yield anyway. What I've seen is that the rice was did better. And then in the feed trial, I won't say that at in the greenhouse, we also did a feed trial, which now we also wanted to see whether if we add nitrogen, in other words, having an integrated approach, let's add inorganic fertilizer to our organic fertilizer to find out if that will further enhance production. We did that. And then, well, a combination of 50 kilograms per hectare urea and 100 kilograms per hectare rice box gave the optimal yield from that uh, study and it's published in Ogodo et al. 1999. Well, as part of waste, we also have a lot of effluents. We have effluents that came from our industry and we have worked with several of them. Cassava meal effluent. In fact, what generated our interest in that was the fact that we found a lot of grating machines where we, you know, located in urban areas, you know, all over the place, machines for grating cassava. So we really think it might be good to go to those areas, collect the effluent from the machine, and find out the effect on the soil and then the effect also on the plant. When we did that, and we also had interesting results. First, the effluent had a serious effect on one of the bacteria of the Serratia genus. What happened? In the non effluent soils, that bacterium was there. But when effluent was added to that soil, at the end of the day, it inhibited the growth of that very bacteria. Apart from the effect on the organisms, we also found that we had an interesting result which we had to take to our soil science conference. We observed that the cassava meal effluent had an effect on the texture of the soil. Where well, I'm aware that there are soil scientists here this evening. And usually in soil science, it is more of a sample sound belief that texture as a property does not change. And so when we did that, and then we found that uh, this thing, there appears to be a shift in the texture. Where somehow we boldly took it to a conference I had in Berlin. I think that was in 1999, Soil Science Conference. We presented the results. For after more discussion, and then the conclusion was that, well, what was happening was that the cassava meal effluent had a lot of sodium in it. And that sodium may have caused more dispersion of the clay particles in the soil, which resulted in the change we are saying. So we have to put that change in the water command. It's not normal. If you use the routine analysis, that will not uh, happen. Well, apart from cassava meal effluent, we've also done some things with abattoir effluent. Where we're all familiar with abattoirs. If you go there, we we'll find that after cleaning the cow, before I bought their meat, they pour water on the ground to wash you know, everything. We also went and collected some of the effluents to also find out, knowing that it might be very rich in calcium, in other words, it might be useful in lining acid soils. So we did some research on that, and then those results are published in Ogodo in 2008, 2008, B. And then in doing that work, we also reintroduced rice husk to find that rice husk can be useful, you know, in ameliorating the effect of the abattoir effluent. And we found very good and interesting result that the rice husk actually enhanced the yield of the base that was used as test crop. Well, apart from cassava meal effluent and the uh, abattoir effluent, we have some data here to be published on the effects of the finally effluent, both treated and untreated. Fish pond effluent, but well, the fish pond issue is quite understood. Behind my office, we have some fish ponds there, so we easily get effluent for our study. So we have those ones, they are here to be published on microbiotization of soil and other soil practices. Well, what might interest us, very well, from the Niger data here, is the last thing we'll talk about in our research. Bioremediation 
of polluted soils. Well, we all are aware of the issue of soil crude oil pollution in Nigeria. Uh, it's both a scientific issue and a political issue. Well, the first thing we have seen is like a flow station where perhaps the crude has spilled. That's because A. And then, figure B shows where this oil has spilled into. Those were cassava plants before, and we have seen what has become of them as a result of the pollution. And then we also find this farm, see part of the cassava farm, see what they have become, what the crude oil has turned the farm into, you know, the crude oil spillage. And that is why, well, the agitation for compensation is well endorsed and well supported that the oil companies, the government, should find ways of compensating these individuals. But the story does not end there, really. We are going to talk science and talk science. There's a possibility of these soils being reclaimed. There's a possibility of these soils, you know, being, in fact, getting them back, you know, to be used for crop cultivation and for other purposes. And that is done through bioremediation, which has also attracted our attention. Bioremediation is the use of some organic materials to kind of correct anomalies in the soil. The thinking of the soil microbiome is this, that when you introduce those materials to the soil, you are going to step up the activities of organisms. Because the crude oil, actually, why crude oil damages soil is that as soon as crude oil lands on the soil, it does a major thing. It blocks the soil pores. In other words, the air spaces within the soil are blocked. And therefore, the organisms cannot breathe, and the roots of the plant cannot also breathe. And eventually, they just die. A lot of the organisms, you know, die off. But when you introduce organic materials into that kind of soil, you know, it rejuvenates the activities of these organisms. They begin to multiply and increase in rate. And as they grow and increase in rate, if I help, they begin to degrade both the materials you have added as well as the crude oil. And so well, those are interesting stories. And uh, we have them published in the Bordeaux in 2004 a Bordeaux in 2006 c And there's all the bacteria and fungi communities. What happens to them after applying crude oil? I've said that briefly. Some die off, some survive. And over time, some go into spores. They form cocoons, which they are able to go through that stress. We find that in Oboda and Aliku, 2015. When the use of poultry matter as a power remediation material of food oil for has been tested, I've not mentioned, we can use things like poultry manual. You know, and in fact, we've done that, and we have published papers on them with the very interesting results. Then, cassava peel can also be used to remediate crude oil for soils. My Vice Chancellor, also. with all that we have done, we are not still resting on our hours. We have some current research going on in our unit in the department. We are looking at the possible use of other animal waste, apart from poultry manure, like your pig dung, cattle dung, goat dung, as soil amendments in the growth of cowpea and the possible impact on microbial population. In fact, I have about three master students currently who are doing that. They're actually out of the field now. They're writing up their data. And we hope that soon we'll be able to publish uh, those ones. We're also evaluating the effects of some effluents, including rubber effluents on the silly growth of EVA residences, and then uh, also the effect on microbial population. Well, I also have uh, two PhD students, and they are here. They actually staff of Rubber Research Institute here in who are working on that. So we are doing some PhD studies on that. Then also, we are also looking at the carbon sequestration in some forest soils. You know, like the movement of carbon from the soil to the plant, to the atmosphere, and then back, you know, to the soil. We are trying to look at all that. As a PhD student who is doing that, she is a staff of Forestry Research Institute of Nigeria. And then, we are also looking at the possible use of some of these 
organisms as bio fertilizer. And we have some works already published on that. I have a colleague in the department who was my student. She did a master's with her, and she's still my student, really, whether she likes it or not. <laughs> uh, we have some publications, hopefully, a tour. 2014, and then uh, Edosa et al. 2016. Then we are also looking at, I had mentioned about the rhizosphere earlier, the rhizosphere of the plant is the region where you actually find diverse organisms. We have done some work looking at the rhizosphere of oil palm, uh, where I also have a younger colleague now, who is in the department, who did that work on that book. He was my master's student, and currently is also my PhD student. We just published that in the last other conference, which held earlier this month. So my Vice Chancellor, sir, again, why thank you for the privilege of this novel lecture. I want to make some acknowledgments. And that has to begin with the Almighty God. But first and foremost, I want to thank God, who is our Creator, the Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who loved me so much and gave me His only begotten Son. And like I said, when I was 2015, I didn't think I would live in 2017. Look so far, you know. But I thank God He has preserved my life, and today has turned out to be a reality. The Scripture says, "It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not." Again, in Psalm 144, verse 1, David, who was a warrior, had this to say. Say, Blessed be the Lord, my strength, which teaches my hands to walk and my fingers to fight. Well, recognizing that I'm not a warrior, so to say, but in other sense, I'm a warrior. <laughs> but borrowing the words of our 2005, I want to say, you know, he said, I thank the Lord for training my hands for research and my fingers for holding the chalk to teach, and my pen to write scholarly papers. So, so I'm indeed very grateful to God. And then, there are some persons in a location like this, one we have to acknowledge. First, my late parents, Afre, Osaku Agodo, and Omerigo Agodo, but somehow, I happen to be the baby in the family. <laughs> uh, don't interpret that to me that I'm a small boy. <laughs> <laughs> I happen to be the baby in the family. And uh, despite being the baby, they made sure I was not spoiled. They ensured I went to school from primary school to university. I would have wished they were here today. But God, in His sovereignty, you know, has made it in such a way that they are not here. I also want to remember the late Abishu of Church of God Mission. That's Abishu of B.A. Idaosa, who actually was a father, a friend, and a pastor to very many people, including myself. I also remember my late parents in law, who gave me the very beautiful wife I have. I'm talking about her. Mr. Richard Asikabe and Mrs. Christiana, I know Asikabe, in your name, of blessed memory. And then, on that list too, my elder sister, one of my elder sisters, about the second born of my parents, you know, who died two about last year. And then my brother-in-law, Mr. Ignovia. And then my friends and Christian brothers, who have gone to be with the Lord, people like Dr. Isemila, was in I4, uh, that James Ojoma, Brother Ernest Timade, and several others, Dave Oko, and then not long ago, when Dr. Abani was actually in the first hospital in Lagos, one of those Ebola doctors who had that uh, issue. Well, I remember them today because we were close, and one or the other, they were quite useful to me. Then my family, the uh, Jokowodo family is a very large one, you know. I want to thank God that when the, 
the head of the family, if I painfully, if I was with pain, he told me we will not be. He tried to move the journey, but somehow he had to go to Abuja. He was called for an urgent business in Abuja. That's the end of the of Ogodo. So he's not here. But the very first child of my mother, our father is here, who is our mother now, Mrs. J.K. Lewin. I also have uh, now my senior sisters, Mrs. Agnes Ibnogia, she's also here. And then uh, I have my immediate senior brother, Mr. Augustine of Bogota. I think I cited him somewhere in the okay. <laughs> uh, when they all looked after me as a kid, went to them as still a kid anyway. <laughs> and then also, I have many causes. Two of them are well, two of them are here, and I want to just mention their names. I have General Samuel of Yahweh, a retired general and engineer from the Army, he's also here. Then uh, I have <laughs> Dr. Godwin of Ogodo, whose wife happens to be the media pass registrar of the University of Benin. And then I have many nieces and nephews, really. And one of them had to fly this morning from the Brazil, of course, she must come. And that is Princess Mrs. Abeyuwa Eredjawa, because she actually she is a man. <laughs> well, so that I will save time. My in-laws, I also want to express appreciation to them. And my uncle in-law is here, the head of the family presently. That's Uncle Lomo in Boreme. He is an auto general. He also said, well, he must attend his inaugural lecture. And then I have my wife's elder brother and sister here to Professor Ibaremi of BIU and uh, Mrs. Remisi, who is a retired principal. <laughs> There's somebody in the Ibaremi family I also want to mention. He's been a friend, he's quite close to us, myself and my wife, that Dr. Ofure Ibaremi. Thank you for coming. <laughs> he's a retired commander secretary. Well, my teachers, beginning from primary to secondary, I've known all of them today. But in the book, I listed those I remember in the university. My late supervisors, I mentioned their names earlier. And then some of my professors at the University of Nigeria, Osuka, and Ibadu. Then to the university administration, my vice chancellor, I want to thank you again for this opportunity to deliver this 194th inaugural lecture of this university. The DVCs, the principal officers, I'm especially grateful to you all for the peaceful atmosphere that has been maintained in the University of Benin. I also want to thank our immediate past Vice Chancellor, Professor Ojo Shui, who actually announced my professorship. And in the same vein, when I was made in of fabric, he accepted that appointment. And a lot of members who witnessed in the faculty, you know. He actually, if I whatever we sent to him for approval, he virtually nearly in all situations approved all. And I think that is why we have a lot of <laughs> And then I also want to please acknowledge Professor now. Uh, he's not here today, former Vice Chancellor. Really, I was employed in this university under his tenure. I'm saying so because I didn't know the man. I came for an interview. And at the end of the interview, the reports were submitted to him. But later I got to know that when he was being asked, when the list was taken to him to approve those that should be employed, he ticked my name as one of those to be employed. So really, I appreciate him. The one in the I like Professor Wanzi, a former VC too. Who, despite the fact that I was new in this university, made me head of the department, and then that's my associate professorship. Then the faculty of agriculture, my faculty, if I that is a faculty that we are like a family there, my data. I must commend him for the strides he's taking 
to take our faculty to higher levels than he met it. So then I'm grateful to you. Then our other professors, very it impossible for me to list all the names of the staff in the faculty, I would have done that. But it's, not, it's just that it's not possible. We have about 200, both academic and non-academic staff. But I had a very good working relationship with virtually everyone, both the academic and the non-academic staff. So I want to thank you all. Our entire professors, the Lomu, who is actually the foundation dean of the faculty, uh, Ali Khan, Ms. Zegareva, and uh, Dr. Okoro. Well, I call them as senior citizens. They actually were of great help to me as dean. And then my senior colleagues, because I remember Karen came very early today. I want to thank you for finding time to attend this Professor Ikatwa, Professor Igene, who was team when I was employed, and then Professor Iremire. I want to assume he's here. I want to thank him especially. Okay, sir. You know why? Iremire gave me a push to do CPC in Nogora. You know, he, he was the one, even as dean, who come and say, ah, prof, it's good to have this team as dean. <laughs> if I did not stop there, he went and brought copies of his own inaugural lecture at, at Akure, brought the one of Professor Gini from Akure, also brought one from the University of Science and Technology, Kumasi, Ghana. And I said, look, I can look at all these ones and begin to write my own. So, so I want to thank you especially to you. <laughs> Another professors in the faculty, you know, they are Professor Adekule, Professor Rerwata, where they are all listed in the book for time. Professor Okonji, Professor Mokaro, who was my assistant, Professor Morek, who was also an assistant, they were not professors then. If they were, they wouldn't have accepted to be assistant. <laughs> and then the university, well, in the course, well, I've worked here now for about uh, 16 years. I came here in 2001. In the process of working, I've had occasion to interact with many persons. Some were fellow deans with me, and some of them are still deans, the, the so I want to thank all of them. And then, where well, some are here, Professor Ms. Obu, so Mrs. Uh, Nabulele, uh, Professor. Okay. I wanted to say the other name. Thank God I didn't say the other one. So, and then the other things that are here, we suppose we want. And then, of course, a very big way, who is like if I two of them, they are like my elder brothers in this community. Professor Yahweh, I must acknowledge you. Very good, most important. And then, Professor Hoya who is very honorably absent from this uh, inaugural lecture. But there are several other persons, former DVCs, Professor Nibiri, and then those that served as VCs rep when I was there. Among them, Professor Adia, Professor Toide, Professor Owe, and then late Professor Ofio. And then as part of the university community, my senior, and he remains my senior. He also came very early today for today's lecture, Professor Irafuna. In fact, he said, the secondary school attended. He may not know, he was one of those that attracted me to that school. Really. The day we know the entrance to Hermosa, they used him to invigilate us. At that time, we saw this young boy, sorry, Sam, same boy. <laughs> who came, you know, did the vigilation together with our other person. So I don't feel, ah, this is who I would like to come to. So, sir, thank you for coming. And several others were here. I have colleagues from outside the university. Please, I have, before I leave university community, I must also mention Professor Amosis Longe. That's a couple I got used to, even before I got employed in this place. If I went with that, it problem in Benin. They asked us to be a place on this campus. But we went often to fetch water. They almost gave us a room in their house. <laughs> so colleagues from outside the University of Bini, I have several colleagues from Mekoma here, Abruzali University, where I began my academic career. I want to thank you all for coming. 
and some names are mentioned in the light of time. I'm not going to go through the list. But I will just mention uh, Professor S. U. Remisi, who was actually the dean of the Faculty of Agriculture, and one time acting vice chancellor of the university. I will also mention, though she's not here, because of the favor I had under her, Professor Mrs. Goodwell. The scholarship that took me to the UK, she was the dean of science when I was nominated for that scholarship. And then my students, I also have colleagues, please, apart from Performa, from NIFO, very close friends. Uh, the immediate past executive director, in fact, he called me, so he said, when is that lecture? I said to him, he said, we certainly come. Dr. Asemota, and I can see him seated somewhere. I also have people from India and Among, who also came to be part of this lecture. Then my students, I'm actually very grateful to you. Then my pastors, of course, uh, at the Archbishop of Church of God Mission, Archbishop Margaret in Dahosa, she's outside the country. These are my pastors, those that taught me the scriptures. Reverend Dr. Peter Abada is here. Then my pastor, Dr. Habib, is also here. And then Bishop Mokwe. Oh, the Bishop, the Bishop, the Bishop of there is also here. And then several others, more like Mokwe, who has pastored me. You know, they are all listed there and acknowledged. And then the Church of God Mission family. All, many of them are here from Miracle Center, from Church of God Mission Ubo, and also from Church of God Mission. If I hear them, before I came here, they were already here. They came in the house. They're my brothers and sisters in Christ. They are actually very many. <laughs> well, I tried, I tried, I tried, but of course, I had to stop. So please, you don't find your name there. Just understand that it was more of an art of uh, commission and not deliberate uh, commission. Then my neighbors, Professor Osubo is one of them, Professor Ahideo Pamakonosi. We are from Basim and we lived in the same compound for years before we to move to our separate uh, houses. I have a wonderful neighbor, that will make research easy for me. The funding agencies, we must have had when our uh, vice chancellor read the citation. I had funding from the Institutional Council, Federal Government, University of Ibadan, though that scholarship was not utilized, and then the European Commission. On the list of acknowledgement, my wife and children, very sincerely this afternoon, this is a very rare occasion that the husband has to appreciate the wife. And I want to put on record today that Family Daily Charity remains my peer. In the words of Shakespeare, and my wife, as I often call her, more are your dues than tongues can tell. And if the Bible says you typify or you actually represent that virtuous woman spoken of in the scriptures. <laughs> and for me, it's a virtuous woman. So I actually say that uh, if you look around, she's the prettiest woman here today. Wow. Our second child, then a Rosanaga, it's the torture, and then our baby, Rosa Mami. Then Emosa, yeah, he got married in December to Izua, who became our fifth child. <laughs> Emosa, yeah, is a medical doctor. Emosa, yeah, is a dentist. 
the Rosa is a pharmacist. And I believe it's our daughter. And then our fifth child, our fifth child, Zoa, is actually a computer scientist. Apparently, my in-laws, I forgot to mention the parents of Izoa are here, really. And uh, Dr. and Mrs. Sahano, I want to thank you for that. Well, sir, as I begin to bring this lecture to a close, I have some recommendations to make, a very serious recommendation. But I'm going to decide in the next five minutes to do that. As a matter of urgency, where these recommendations, some are general, based of my knowledge of soil science. As a matter of urgency, we believe that the government should put in place a machinery for the production of a detailed soil map for this country. Woo! And the reason is this, we cannot be talking of farming without a soil map. A soil map will actually show the areas that are best suited for what crops. If you have to grow maize here, a soil map will tell you. If you have to grow plantain here, a soil map will say so. Then we also, in St. Macro, I also insist that a, that kind of map must include an inventory of soil organisms. Then by way of another recommendation, based again on my knowledge of soils, generally, we are also pleading that we should do something about the machines we are using on our soils. Some of the important agricultural machines we use on our soils ultimately destroy the soils because they were not originally designed for our soils really. And that happened, I'm not just talking theory, that happened in Agbede farms, it happened in Warake farms. You know, they were all good ideas, but at the end of the day, those farms, the soils got kicked, and over time, they were not being used. But I think as a nation, we are very intelligent engineers, agric engineers, mechanical engineers, production engineers, you know, who can actually, using information from soil, from soil scientists, develop machines that can be used on our soils. And then I also think there's the need for us to train more personnel in agriculture. Interest in agriculture is actually declining. You know, the enrollment is going down. Well, we are lucky in the University of Illinois because we have a lot of constructive people. <laughs> who chose other courses. <laughs> and then, as a faculty, we are happy with that anyway. And the students have come to love agriculture, jokes aside. The students have come to actually love agriculture. And I think government needs to pay more attention. Beyond this brainstorming, beyond this leave service, we need to train more personnel. And also, a major reason for that decline which one is the fact that it might shock some of us to know that agriculture is not classified as a profession in the career structure of this country. And so that is why you find that even within this community here, you have a great assistant, for example, in our county. He has more than a great assistant in our faculty because it is regarded that look, this agri is not part of the career structure. So we play with government. You know, agriculture is a noble profession. It ought to be one of the major career structures in our nation. And then now to be, to be more specific. My research, I've talked about early crop, and I think we should encourage early crop. You know, for what we saw, it can be used on mountains, it can save costs for the farmer. It also broadens the base of research in agriculture. Early cropping brings researchers from forestry, so we are talking about tree legumes, being researchers from animal science. Lucina is actually a folder, even for animals. And then, being researchers from soil science, even from crop science. So it is highly recommended. Then the use of biopesticides for the control of pests should also be encouraged. A lot of the pesticides we use now do some damage to the soil. You know, they leave toxic residues in the soil, which in some cases they find their way back and we eat them in our vegetables and they cause harm. Then we use biopesticides. As we said, they are friendly and they are benign sources of uh, you know, elements. The bioremediation procedure can be used to remove oil polluted soils. Our soil microbiologists should be part of the team involved in such 
the mission exercise. So we're talking about fermentation. When the soil is taken over by crude oil, all is not lost. There's a chance of it being reclaimed. And then the use of more fertilizers in crop production should be encouraged. You know, in place of inorganic fertilizers. Although we may not be able to do away completely with inorganic, but we should have more use of bar fertilizers. Then there's also the need for more modern and functional equipment. Not only in the subject area of soil microbiology, but in virtually every science discipline. I think government should be more sincere, more proactive. You know, give us more equipment. Well, we had an experience recently in our unit in the department. We had a publication we sent somewhere in Europe to a very good journal. In very few days, they returned the paper to us. Moments. They agreed that the title was very okay. It was worth researching it to. It was a fine subject matter. But they now said they have a major observation that the equipment we use for the study couldn't have isolated all the organisms we are looking for. That there are more equipment that we would have used that would have isolated some other organisms. So that is the problem we are. And then, lastly, of course, my they will tell you that well, you are advised to publish this one in a local uh, journal. <laughs> Usually that is what happens. So that is what I'm saying. It's not enough to say, you know, if you say we have a PCR of all model, what version is that PCR we are using? If we say we have GC, gas chromatograph, what version, what model is it? If we are saying we have a AAS, atomic, whatever, what version is it? Because the people that are bringing there, they are using the current version of 2017, not even the one of 2015. So I think our government should be more proactive. Vice Chancellor, also, as I bring this lecture to a close, we want to again remind us of our topic, the hidden wall, the impact on us all in the quest for our daily bread. In that prayer, the Lord taught us, give us this day our daily bread. And we have seen that the soil plays an important role in that quest for our daily bread. Within the soil exist numerous organisms. In the past one hour, I have tried to summarize the numerous activities of these organisms. They are created by God and they are described as the architects and the engineers in the soil that help to maintain the health and quality of the soil in particular and the environment in general. Mr. Vice Chancellor, also, as I bring this lecture to an end, while acknowledging that this is indeed, strictly speaking, an academic event in the traditional university system. I give you indulgence, sir. And with my faith and belief, to also bring to the attention of this very distinguished and noble audience the story of another hidden war. Although this war is not subject to empirical observations or empiricism, you cannot collect empirical data. It is however spoken of in the Holy Bible. In John 14, 1 to 3, the Bible says, In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. If you are not so, I would have told you that I will go and come back and take you to myself. Also in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, the scriptures declare, I has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God is preparing for those. Who are serving him. Therefore, don't presently heed it. That word will be made manifest at the end of time. It's a word prepared for those who have experienced salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. The only important question to this very distinguished audience today is Have you experienced that salvation provided by God through His only begotten Son? My prayer is that everyone here will partake of that word where it is made manifest in Jesus' name. Amen. The immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
Thank you very much. A better round of applause for The Vice Chancellor will decorate our uh, inaugural lecturer officially. We invite his immediate family to please come forward. that are seated here. May I quickly acknowledge the presence of Emeritus Professor Anya Emeritus Professor Raymond Elao. Professor Union. Uh, Debbie OFR. We recognize the presence of a senior advocate here present, Chief Edosawa. A member of the Governing Council of the University of Benin, the immediate past Dean Faculty of Law. Professor Richard Idubo, PhD. We also want to recognize uh, the presence of another member of the University Governing Council, Dr. Adam Okumbo. Our chaplain is seated. May I recognize? Venerable and Mrs. Malcolm. We recognize the presence of Bishop and Mrs. Sam Imokwede. Brigadier General Samuel of Yahweh.
Engineer Professor C.N. Owabodin, College of Technology, Federal University of Petroleum Resources. We want to welcome you. He was a one time Deputy Governor of our state, Reverend Dr. Peter Obadam. I've been asked to recognize especially this man of God that is leading the inaugural lecturer in the ways of the Lord, Reverend Dr. Abib Usman. <laughs> Children of God, praise the Lord. I was thinking after all the sermon, he was going to add second collection. We recognize senior colleagues from AAU. We want to recognize you. All members of CGN, we want to welcome you. Thank you for coming to you. A one-time commissioner and a state commissioner in charge of health, Dr. Wilson Imogan. We also recognize the presence of Reverend Mrs. Ekberiji. We have Reverend Omeriki is here representing the Khan President. Professor CM Owabo is representing the Vice Chancellor of FUPRI. I saw you wanting to quickly make the correction. You know, professors, they want you to do things accordingly. Professor Yahweh, am I lying? We want to recognize the presence of the former Deputy Vice Chancellor of the University. Professor Abolagba is sitting very close to you, sir. He said I should recognize you very well. Professor Onibere, you want to welcome my recognition, sir. Honestly, the list before me is endless, but they say I must recognize our very own, the woman that contested as vice deputy governor in Edo State, the deputy governor candidate, Jane Osage. Are you aspiring in 2019? <laughs> they say women talk to women. Women understand. If you are a woman, clap for yourself. <laughs> Immediately after this section, the inaugural lecturer is inviting each and every one of us to join him at the Faculty of Agri Cooperative Conference Hall close to June 12th building, immediately after now. Students, this is not for you. You are writing your exams. And you know the Vice Chancellor does not want you to fail. And so your refreshment has been prepared specially at a student quarter immediately after the closing formalities we shall let you know where you should go to may we please rise Univent Ante.
remains standing, the Vice Chancellor will lead the procession out of the auditorium. Students, you go to Faculty of Agric LT1.